Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome, this is Sister Dora. I'm the Education Events Coordinator for NOFA Mass. <clears throat> and I'll be your host for this evening. Welcome to the Bioremediation of Urban Soils with Andrew Lorian. Andrew Lorian is the Bioremediation Coordinator for NOFA Mass. He also works with, uh, he also is the Youth Coordinator for Garden in the Community in Springfield, Mass. And he's also a lifetime urban farmer. First, I want to thank all of the Dofa Mass staff and board members who have helped to make this online event possible. I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, MDAR. And of course, most importantly, I would like to thank all of you. The house rules for today. Um, we're gonna take questions as Andrew go along. Um, if we unmute your phone, sometimes we might unmute your phone if we are not able to understand your question and you would have to um, speak through the mic. Once you're done, we ask that you please um, mute your phone back so you would not uh, disturb the presenters. Um, I think that's it. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Andrew Larian. Andrew? Thanks, thanks, Isadora. Um, I'm gonna go ahead here and share my screen so we can get started and get into this. Are we good? The Basketball Hall of Fame there? Yes, so, sir. Uh, we're coming out of... We're coming out from Springfield, and it's really exciting to see the chat open up um, and see um, folks from Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and um, other places um, that really hits home. Um, and that's, this is a good way to start to show you where we're from. Um, a lot of our students uh, do share common um, interests when it comes to urban agriculture as far as like acquiring spaces and just trying to figure out uh, the best way to use those and keep them sustainable. Um, so thank you guys for coming. It's good to see everybody. It feels like um, we're not alone in this. And uh, this is a picture of us. Uh, this is Ibrahim Ali from GTC, along with the youth um, here on Walnut Street. And um, you know, this, this guy was here when we we started this project off. And um, um, as with a lot of the folks that have been introduced to this project and have been in, uh, there's been a little rotation as far as who's been uh, around. But, you know, as I go around the site on Walnut Street, I see all the remnants of what um, uh, Ibrahim was into um, and what they were doing on the site um, before we started the project. So um, whether they knew it or not, they were into the remediation process long before uh, this grant. So um, in this particular space, um, a lot on Walnut Street, there was a little bit of concern of potential uh, contaminants due to the way the space was used in the past. Um, so it was pretty much tarped and unused and uh, we would stage uh, items over here and whatnot. But um, the goal was to reclaim the space and this is just kind of what it looks like uh, similar to a backyard. But right away, we knew we had to get the soil covered um, in many ways. So I just wanted to snap this picture in real quick just to show you like a quick, uh, a quick change. Um, observations alone will just uh, show you a lot and tell you a story about what's there. Um, when we're entering this the site or any site, we're not just looking at the problem. You know, we're not just looking at all right there. There might be a contaminant here, or a particular weed that I don't want to see. Um, we're also looking at the the healthy function. Um, we're looking at what does exist in these spaces, uh, what does thrive, uh, what is the plants and the weeds on site telling us. We had this really aggressive uh, weed uh, that grew laterally, like right beneath the soil surface and right underneath the tarp that was here. Uh, so we did, uh, we tried to get as much of that uh, out of there as possible just so to leave space for the project to at hand. So let me round it off a little bit. We're just uh, showing you the seedling and uh, what it is and uh, 
a lot of people that get interested into gardening or farming, uh, whether you have a windowsill or any kind of greenhouse, scoop house space, we get these uh, this great germination um, and these great seeds. You can see the roots and, and as they go and reach um, the same way the leaves do for um, things in order for it to survive, right? Um, but the deal is like, what's next? And um, bear with me in my thought process here because if it looks like this, I'll eat it. You know what I mean? Like if, it, if it's this healthy, um, and, and I'm coming from a place where, you know, I don't always eat well. Uh, a lot of people think I'm, I'm this like uh, vegetable guru, vegan guy that um, has a, like an incredible diet because of, um, you know, what I try to uh, promote in my life and whatnot. But the fact is I, I, I grew up eating, you know, box mac and cheese and chicken nuggets and but I believe if, if, if the vegetables look good and um, grow them yourself and, and that taste difference, um, they can mean a lot. Um, and when we're talking about taste and um, growth and, you know, the food system and where we're getting our food and how we can get it locally, what it means sustainably, what it means with monies, um, what also does it mean for health, you know? When we look at this, do we look at mental health? Um, you know, we think about health and mental health, uh, you know, there's a lack of minerals a lot of times that people are going through or deficiencies, you know, due to social determinants of health. So if we realize that these foods that we're putting in our body also contain minerals and we study those and we try to make sure that our soils are feeding our plants, then um, we have something else to talk about here. And uh, this this is just a beautiful picture of what I call like you know that black gold. Um, but more importantly, this is uh from our, our worm bin. So in here we have um some red wigglers, and we have you see some of the organic matter still breaking down, and we have some worm eggs in there, uh, which is very interesting just to see, to look at, to experience, and um think about our decomposers and our sites. So um, since this project started, we're you know. One, our hands and knees, looking on uh, all kinds of fungi. We're looking at all the plants that exist differently now. Um, not in the sense of like this is a weed, but this is a plant, or this is somebody telling a story. And this is another one of those pictures that, um, I mean, I'm gonna let it speak for itself. But when we're talking about uh, mycelium, just lifting a piece of cardboard up and finding this life. Um, it's something extraordinary once you once you realize what it is, you know. If you have any interest in farming and and the most natural techniques and ways, um, because you know farming is not natural. It's you know would be foraging or you know going to the best areas on earth to to eat certain things. Um, so what we're doing is always intentional. Uh, that's much what we're doing here in this process. So we're documenting um, all of we, what we see and we're doing our best to identify it. Uh, we got some help from uh, Willie Crosby from Fungi Ally. He's great. Um, he's got a wealth of information um, about fungi and mushrooms. And that's the thing here is to um, not work alone and uh, reach out when you have questions and uh, look for that consultation. Uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. So all we got to do is understand what the soil is telling us, what these, what the fungi is telling us, and um, get to know the story. Because then we'll get to know ourselves a little bit um, as well. So what we want to do is um, when we approach these areas and whatnot, when we talk about bioremediation, sometimes we, we like to know what we're dealing with. There's different tests we can um, perform. Um, if you have the money to do so, you can go to some of the, um, the labs, the site contest labs um, that will test for uh, all the heavy metals in the soils and give you some, um, some good uh, things to look for there. UMass is, in, is another route to do like a basic uh, routine soil analysis. Um, I, use, I use them in the past to just determine if there's lead in the soil and um, what nutrients are or aren't there. So uh, there's some good um, resources. At GTC, like I said, they've been doing the work. Uh, they've been remediating the soil for quite some time. So um, it was a good opportunity to just look at, uh, deeper into what it is that they're doing. and. Um, have that better understanding that it's not just um, a process or some sort of rules that we're following, um, but instead we're learning and we're growing um, as well. So we're doing some um, IMOs, which is very exciting. So we'll, what we need for these IMOs is like um, some cooked rice. We use some uh, burlap to 
wrap our uh, rice up like a burrito or a sushi roll, your food of choice. And what we're doing is we're burying these um, about four inches into the ground. Sometimes we um, change, you know, the level we buried it. We even um, put one of these under a pile of leaves. And what we're trying to do is uh, essentially like go fishing um, for microbes. So, you know, anybody can just kind of throw that hook and worm into the water and hope for a fish. But, uh, you know, the more skilled um, uh, fishermen, they're going to they're gonna look in the right spot. You know, they're going to think, hey, there, there might be a tree knocked down over there. So uh, there's a good chance there's some fish feeding under there, you know. So, you know, using that analogy, we're, we're just trying to meet what it is that is under the surface. So um, we're picking our spots. And we're digging them in. Um, it's always exciting when you can do something that is a simple project, but uh, very much uh, science at the same time. And um, after about a week, uh, we'll say about four days, uh, more or less, depending on humidity and temperature, uh, we will un uncover our traps. Um, and it's important that you mark them because there's been uh, cases where we lost traps. <laughs> So um, we never were able to recover our rice trap. Um, so there's some microbes feeding on that uh, somewhere. And this is what it looks like. Um, without a microscope, um, we can still see the microbes and they represent themselves in um, color. And color, and we see mold. So we see some pink, um, a curry chicken color often came up, uh, yellowish. And then um, we also had like some hot pinks and some greens. Uh, so it was very interesting and then we'll be able to uh, learn about which microbes are we meeting, which bacteria is it that we're meeting, and what is their purpose. Now, uh, these are called, um, at this point, this will be IMO1, okay? So we're learning all this here, and it's very exciting to be whipping around, you know, IMO1s and words like that. So once you know the meaning of it, uh, it's very powerful, um, as I've heard this before. And we're beginning to understand um, that we're just collecting the microbes. And um, we're looking for beneficial bacteria. And what we can do from there is we can get uh, pure uh, raw sugar. And um, yeah, I, I don't know if I had answers out of but uh, just double check to make sure I'm using the right stuff here. But we want to get that, that raw sugar and we're going to mix it down with our um, sample. It's an even amount, right, with the, the, white, the rice and the microbes. And we're going to let that grow out. We're going to call this our IMO2. Um, so a lot of the work that we'll be doing uh, coming up this uh, this season is understanding the IMO2 um, and how to inoculate that and turn that into um, IMO3. So whether we're um, you know putting this into a biochar or into a brand um, of some sort and um, growing this out and just using these tools um, and these microbes to uh, help us along the way in our process. That's what we're going to do. We're going to expand these microbes out and we're going to put them to work. Um, and we're also using ferments, which is pretty exciting. So um, we'll have some slides and talk about that as well. Um, let me go back to this slide here. So um, other than making our own ferments, we were able to, uh, through the grant, uh, get a consultation from Advancing Eco Agriculture. And they were able to give us a recipe of inoculants uh, made up of bacteria and whatnot that can, um, you know, they serve different purposes. Some of them can survive in toxic environments, and some have been known to break down hydrocarbons and metals in the soils. So uh, we're adding these uh, to our soils in, um, you know, specific amounts to um, add that bacteria and whatnot to our soils. Um, these are this is pictures of more uh, cover crop. Like I said, uh, GTC has been um, um, remeeting the soils for some time. So the soils that they do produce uh, food on um, have been worked on for many years and tested. Um, and we're just working on a particular site in the back. But as you can see, man, the, the beauty of uh, covering the soil um, on top and below. A little mix, another section here. So also uh, at GTC, we've been building compost bins this year. So when we talk about sustainability, um, the food system, and closing the loop, 
on um, all avenues of agriculture and what that entails. Um, compost is very much a part of that. Uh, when we talk about the food system, as far as the farmer, the farm supplier, you know, distributor, processors, and um, you know, the whole the retailers and consumers, often the, the the waste conversation gets left out of that. Um, and I think that we're responsible for that. And with these bins that we're creating, and the, the material that we have on hand in DC, we're able to um, utilize some of this in our projects in the back. So um, we're thankful for the knowledge that the youth have acquired over the seasons and they're able to apply it when it comes to these um, types of projects. As you can see, um, as soon as the bin uh, got built, it got filled. Uh, we're using different materials, straws, food scraps, um, and we're able to have enough bins uh, to uh, flip constantly and also uh, have sacrificial bins uh, for her. You know, the just in case, we even we're not sure if we want to return something to our gardens or not, whether it's a weed or something we think could be potentially contaminated for whatever reason. Um, and with the compost, we want to take special interest in um, representation. Uh, and that hits home for me when uh, getting into a lot of this urban ag or just agriculture in general and doing a lot of learning. Uh, we don't see a lot of familiar faces doing the work um, and not a lot of familiar spaces either. So uh, to see uh, people that look like us doing work and um, of course, a lot of these new practices that we want to talk about, um, you know, whether it's food forest, regenerative ag, all this um, different ways of permaculture. Uh, what we're really talking about is uh, the indigenous ways of doing things um, that are most, you know, most old and ancient. So. Um, we have something to connect with when we're doing this uh, this work, and um, Andrew, there are resources. And what we're going to do, yes, we have a, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so it says here, I may have missed this. Are you looking for remediating organic toxins mm -hmm. or metals or something else? That's the first question. Yeah, so uh, well, first what we wanted to do is approach this potentially contaminated situation um, and then, you know, all the ways and how to do that. Um, and what we had found on our sites was a concentration um, of, of higher le levels of, because, you know, we're all going to have like lead and whatnot in, in our, we almost kind of need some of these things, but in excess. Um, so we found high levels of lead and we found some hydrocarbons. Uh, we found Cadmium, 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 and chromium, I believe. Um, so there, these are the type of things that we want to figure out is how do we analyze our test results. Um, so we're working closely with um, some of our team at NOFA um, and some of our team connected with the grant to try to figure out. So, so basically, yeah, we have like some high uh, heavy metals that we're trying to um, use natural methods to uh, take care of. Okay, next question. Should the rice be raw? Okay, yes. Yeah. So the rice is half cooked. Um, so that way it's still kind of hard um, in the middle. So it's slightly broken down, um, you know, slightly soft for them to start to work it, but it's not mush. So half cooked rice. Okay, no more questions yeah, no. at this time. Yeah, and I hope um, I'm doing my best in um, answering this. Uh, we've been talking lately about, you know, uh, what it is to feel like uh, your value and, and what you know on a certain um, uh, topic and project. So I'm always in these situations. I'm calling in, you know, I'm calling in Nancy. I'm calling in Willie. Hey, would you like to talk to this particular thing? But um, do consultations and do this work um, and better understanding of what it is we're doing. We're starting to um, be able to answer these questions a little bit better. Um, and, and be confident in it. So, um, well, I do want to uh, gain some more confidence. Confidence in is being able to understand those uh, the results and how to analyze those. So it, that that's in the works. But we do know that we have a chance to um, we have levels that we're able to uh, see decrease um, hopefully over this uh, three-year period, which we all know uh, remediation can take a very long time. So. Um, Here's another um, 
a method uh, for us to add uh, some tools into our soil that will help us get this job done. Um, Because Mother Nature is going to do it all on her own. And all we want to do is like speed up that process. um, Because it could take a very long time for her to do it. So we we have comfrey here um, and we're just chopping it up. Uh, Comfrey is one of those plants that's uh, great at uh, extracting minerals and um, things from the soil that can be um, used in into our uh, systems. Uh, here's a plant um, many of you are familiar with. And um, once I've learned about like the benefits of comfrey, I just went around um, to any of the spots and just kind of hacked at it uh, in a way that I know it'll come back and um, just began making these ferments and letting them sit for uh, months and months at a time. Um, so, yeah, you know, we break it down. Question. Was that this door? We have another question from, um, yeah. said, how long? Three years, seven years? So I, I guess. So the um, grant is, the, yes. The grant is a three year grant, but, um, you know, after t- speaking with Nancy about the time it takes to analyze uh, plant tissue testing, for example, a uh, good five years uh, will probably be needed. So we'll be looking to extend uh, the funding to be able to continue the tissue t- testing and, and okay, be able so, to compare those results. So they're asking how long, three to seven years, to bioremediate soil to get the lead out. That's what they're asking. Yeah, well, I think that's part of what we're trying to find out, but I, I don't, I can't imagine that there's a, a clear of like math formula or timetable for how to, you know, extract. Um, Cause what we're also learning is that it's not always um, extracted on um, the metals or the toxins, but maybe changed um, the properties changed in such a way or broken down or binded uh, in such a way that they're not able to be taken up by the plants we're going to eat. Um, and we're just trying to learn uh, what, which of those processes are, are what and, um, and how that all works. So yeah, I was thinking, um, you know, cause I had a conversation where I, I like to think of kind of like an analogy and then I was thinking of like um, a filter, right? So if, if you have like, if you're in a, a dusty situation, a, work, a work, workshop, you know, and you got a filter going, it's kind of taking some of those uh, particles and things out of the air, but then you have this filter that you gotta kind of like take out and replace. Um, so you have those things that you're removing. Whereas with this process, um, now, like, don't confuse this for it being the same, but just my thinking is like, like sanitizer, where it's like you, you got germs on your hands and then you, you put something on it and it kind of changes the properties or kills it or does something so that way it's less germy or, or the germs are gone, but you haven't really removed anything. All of it's still there, you know? Um, I'm sorry if that moves anybody, but, it, it, you know, it's just, I'm learning that we, we can also change the properties and change the way that things are taken now um, and not just always extract them. Okay, um, so there's another question and, and thank you for answering those questions. Um, does growing comfrey help or does it have to be chopped and added to the soil? Yeah, so um, we, uh, comfrey is actually part of our uh, plant plan um, that we had came up with to install on our site. So um, it being on the site planted um, is, is highly beneficial in all those kind of ways. Um, and then just the root space it occupies and everything it does as a plant um, can very well be a re- remediator on its own. Um, but then also uh, ferments are something that, are, you know, we're um, building and growing to be able to um, add to the soils to help break down and um, start those processes. Okay. Um, does comfrey take up heavy metals? I tried using sun chokes to take up lead, mm. but I couldn't put them into my compost. That's another question. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I love growing sun chokes and um, what I'm learning is that almost all and any of the plants and bugs that are coming in contact with this soil will act as remediators. Um, you know, for example, I brought up the pill bug in, the, in our last, you know, the roly polies in our last presentation. 
And, you know, we had a conversation about it afterwards. And the fact is I highlighted it as something that removes heavy soils and it's like a bioaccumulator. But what the fact is is that everything that comes in contact with the soil, all the worms, the nematode, all of the things are going to do those same type of things. They're going to have, you know, absorbed some of that. Um, so, yeah, um, I think that I'm not sure exactly if I can answer it. If Humphrey takes up um, the level, you know, into its body, but I believe I believe plants do that. Plants also are, you know, are taken up into their bodies. And then what do we do with it? You know, like how much of what do we compost, and can it be reusable? Um, and those are the kind of questions I'm I'm asking um, ourselves and our work um, as well. Okay, so uh, so we have just two more questions, and then um, we'll let you um, go ahead um, and continue. So. Um, the first question, how do you make the comfrey ferment? And the second question is, how do you apply it? Yeah, so um, what we do is uh, we'll, we'll, we'll gather our comfrey, you know, we'll get our plants. Um, and then, you know, there's a study in that too, where it's like, do we get it when it's flowering? Do we get it when it's young? Um, do we get the mature leaves, the older leaves? Um, so there's always some le more learning to do, but we'll get it, we'll chop it down, you know, the farther you get it chopped down, the more surface area there is for it to break down. Um, so we'll have it looking like that. We'll add our rainwater, or if you have some, or some filtered water is best, um, and you'll let it sit. And we let this sit for months. Um, this is probably sat for maybe four to six months. So we had a few, few things going, so I can't remember exactly which one this was, um, but it's gonna sit, it's gonna stink, um, you want to kind of keep it somewhere where the temperature is not going to get too crazy hot, too crazy cold. Um, and then what we do is like, um, you know, is a simple way of uh, straining it out of the bucket um, into, you know, something smaller to get the big chunks. And what we're going to do is dilute it 500 to one. Um, that number really surprised me when I heard that because um, that just it goes to show you how powerful or how uh, uh, rich this stuff is. Um, so diluted 501, and um, we're just a little bit like a couple of tablespoons or so, a uh, table like per five gallon bucket, and then um, we just water our space. Um, we, we're doing especially watering if we, you know, watering our mulches. We're even watering our compost, um, our walkways. So here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but there's like wood chips kind of in the middle, uh, well, on two thirds mark. Uh, whereas on this side we'll grow some annuals where we'll keep planting, and on the other side we'll grow we'll have our plant plan with perennials, and we'll just study the different spaces. Uh, we'll take tissue samples from whatever plants are prevalent, and we'll um, we'll go on our study along that way. So as you can see here, uh, we have switched sites now. We're on Franklin Street, and we have our comfrey here that we have applied um, to our space when it looks like this. Um, and also that uh, that straw or mulch was a uh, mulch that has been inoculated with a mushroom spawn. Uh, we use wine cap um, in some bins and we use uh, oysters in the other bins. And we'll uh, talk a little bit more about that. But um, you can see growth. Um, so we didn't go crazy about doing uh, much weeding. So things that were there uh, kind of came up. You can see like a lot of like we got some lambs quarters in there, some mugwort, some different grasses um, that are coming up on their own, along with some of our cover crops and the plants that we planted. Um, and already, like just with these crops alone, the, the biodiversity has gone up with bugs. Um, we had a bunny on site nestled in, in there, um, uh, flying uh, pollinators coming by. And here's our plant list uh, that we went with. So here's a, just a simple drawing of how we wanted to have mulch on both sides. And on, in those mulch uh, beds would be blackberries on one side, raspberries on the other side. Um, and we'll have echinacea, comfrey, yarrow, um, uh, native grass, and liatris. So that was a cool little setup of, you know, medicinals mixed with, you know, the medicinal medicinals for us, but also for the soil. And with the raspberries, uh, what we're finding is that um, a lot of fruiting plants 
um, won't concentrate if they are if the plant is taking up some of the toxins or heavy metals the fruit won't necessarily have uh, high concentrations in it um, so the berries the tomatoes things like that so if you really want to grow and you really don't like you're not gonna like take certain steps to figure out how safe it is um, I think the fruiting plants would be what I would where I'd go with um, instead of like um, you know your greens that you would just eat that entire leaf um, these are some of the annuals. Uh, everybody was involved. We were able to grow some ourselves, and then we made a purchase uh, a local plant sales. So we want to document all of the plants, um, the plants that we planted, and the plants that are coming up on their own, and um, just really like take a look at you know what, what it is the soils are telling us. And you can see the beauty of it. Um, so that's the reason why we also picked some flowers and we want to get some bugs in here. Um, and we also just want the space to look good. You don't want like a straight up crazy science mess um, as people are walking by. And and that's kind of a struggle with space. How do we make it productive and, and beautiful? And how long do we have to work with before the community is like, you know, what's going on over there? Um, and these are just some of the plants that were here on site, and we're all familiar with some of these guys, and we made the decision to just get rid of some of them. So through observations, um, we just keep doing our observations where we're taking like a uh, hula hoop size, um, I'm good on time, right? Got a hula hoop size uh, area where we're just kind of like, you know, how much uh, crabgrass is in here? How much um, plants? How much of the soil is exposed? And um, we're just documenting this, where the hole is that we created, and we're able to see the roots, the root structures, um, how far down is the deepest root, and all these things. Um, the youth are able to take soil samples, and we're going to take those samples from around the lot um, in spaces that are representative of our lot, and we're going to send those off to the lab that we mentioned earlier. Um, through this process is dope because not only are we developing our lands and spaces, but the youth who are working in this project are developing and they're able to um, pass on what it is that they know. So we have Bernard here who has um, already performed a carbon proxy test with us, and he is able to lead on showing excuse me, some new youth how to do the process as well. Um, and this is always invigorating. We don't always, we don't want, you know, we want people to all come up together. Like this is a learning process. So like everything that I'm learning right now is the same thing that you see everybody in the world are learning. Um, and, and exciting, it's exciting to see the roots. Uh, like we said earlier, how far do they go down? Uh, when do they start going laterally? How much roots are there? What is the color of your soil? These are all good indicators of soil health. Uh, we want to pay attention to this, record this, um, and this will tell you a little bit about your soil. So these are some of the notes um, that we take. Uh, just to give you an example of when we're doing a soil observation, uh, what it is we're talking about. So, you know, the surface is hard to break. We found two earthworms in a sample. Um, and this was this was like a second sample, whereas the first ones we took, we didn't find any earthworms. So the deepest root we found was eight inches down, you know. So we um, were taking all these uh, observations. Some spots of the lot seemed more healthy, like this place near the tree. Um, so we would attach a picture to that. And um, the dead metal and violet and plants were all taller, more lush and dense in some areas, while others were short, weak, and scattered. So um, there's something um, to learn about all of that, and there's a reason why some plants thrive in certain spaces and not in others. Other um, indications of soil health, which is you know something that we have to look at, we'll talk about remediating soil. What, what's the health of our soil? How do we know if what we're doing is working? Um, filtration. After 30 minutes of having this water sit in this ring, it did not drain. Um, we did have rain previous in the week, but still a healthy soil, that soil would have drained out. We're also doing um, <clears throat> slate tests. So we're able to take a ball of soil um, or, and, and our aggregates. We're able to place it at the top of the jar 
and measure the polyness of the jar and how much of the material falls to the bottom. So these are all very uh, scientific, if you will, um, easy, inexpensive tests that you can do to measure your uh, soil quality. So that way, when you go to take the next steps of action, you know which direction to head. And this is why it's important that um to have that good drainage um or not only that this is why that's why it's important but this is why some soils don't have good drainage because they don't have root systems like this um these are all examples of native plant root systems and you can see um how far down they, they will go so this project has been great um here's uh some more slate uh tests that we're doing. So again, the youth are able to lead in these exercises once they understand them, and that's always um, the aim. And we're taking um, compaction measurements. Okay, so we're talking about um, filtration, but we'll also talk about action. And when you're up here in these 300 numbers, that's when you, you just can't grow. Uh, so roots won't, you know, be able to penetrate that easily. Um, that's a picture of uh, Ibrahim checking out the pentrometer that we're working with in that particular moment. So these guys are part of our um, cover crop mix, and this is the daikon radish or the tillage radish. Um, and this is one of the plants that will help break up that compaction and add organic uh, matter to the material. So you, you would leave these in and let them do their thing, but um, just in our you know excitement of learning and whatnot, we're always uprooting some of the um, things that are supposed to be there doing their remediation, uh, like this pea plant. And we're learning about how peas and legumes are able to fix nitrogen in the soil and how. Um, I didn't get a great photo, but there's like these pink nodules that will latch themselves to uh, these bacteria colonies that will latch themselves to the root systems. And that relationship is what it is that is fixing the nitrogen in the soil. Here's an um, overview of that site on Franklin Street. So um, check your maps. Um, as you can see, these two different maps have kind of two different pictures. So it gives you a story of your land that you might not have known. Uh, there was like a driveway here and a garage. So you can imagine some people working their cars in those type of areas. So uh, the testing that we're doing is right in, at the end of that driveway. Um, compost, uh, we're happening, we're doing that on Franklin Street as well. And as you know, um, it's the important part of the process and it cuts down on cost of adding organic matter. Um, but we found a lot of ants in our bins. So um, we were just wondering if they're good or bad. And um, the fact is that they're incredible at moving things around. And it's actually fascinating to witness the unity and strength of many. Um, and that's just an observation of just just looking at ants and just thinking of the the power they have um, working together and how I wanted to see that, you know. Um, on the other hand, this is a sign of a, a dry compost bin. So we would like our bin uh, slightly moist, and that's something we're working on. So um, once the environment becomes too uncomfortable, they'll move. And um, they do bite. Uh, Bernard turned that off the hard way. I wear no slip flops. All right, so here's that pill bug we were talking about, that uh, roly poly. Um, and we're just always fascinated to document some of the things um, that are happening here. So um, there's all kinds of decomposers, um, bugs, and whatnot. And like I said earlier, um, when I had this slide up, I was going to kind of talk about how, you know, all what, what we thought this was a particular bioaccumulator or um, a particular bug or insect that, you know, uptakes heavy metals. The truth is that all of the insects involved are um they're they're absorbing these uh contents, these metals into their, their bodies. And um with this uh we're just recognizing through our microbe traps, through our um our, our looking at our decomposers that we can see with our visible eye and then imagining the ones that we can't um, the soil food web and the importance of all of the the elements, so it's kind of like a community um, thriving, you know. So like a good a good thriving community has all parts, not just like one person out there is you know spreading the word or doing the work. We need we need more people, you know. And, and at GTC, what is always said um, by my supervisors uh, Tucson is that uh, we don't we don't want to see a hundred farmers come out of GTC out of the youth program 
well, we, we want to see is uh, people who are aware of themselves and their environment, um, who have a better understanding so they can be our, our lawyers, our doctors, our cooks, our, um, our engineers, you know. Uh, so what we need is a community. We need the nematode, the fungi, the protozoa, the plants, organic matter. We need everything at once. So when we're approaching these pro uh, projects to remediate naturally without having to use trucks and, um, you know, scoop this stuff out and bring it somewhere else where it just sits. Um, we need nature. We need a team. Again, we're examining our roots. We're digging them up. We want to see how they occupy space. We want to see what's the big deal or what's the uh, relationship that, that's happening there. Um, and we'll talk about occupied space. That's a below, um, below and above ground. And um, we've we've gotten an obsession of like finding mushrooms and digging them up a little bit and trying to trace that mycelium as far as we can. Um, realizing that the the real star of the show here is the mycelium and not the the mushroom. It's just the the fruiting body. So it's basically the way um, it, it the mycelium reproduces. And that white network of um, root look looking like structure, uh, connecting with the roots and the system, exchanging nutrients, is uh, the community that we're talking about we want to see thrive. So uh, when we, we're doing more micro traps and a lot of our work uh, going ahead is going to be looking at um, how to grow these out and better understand them. So we're planting them you know, close to other plants. Uh, we're digging them next to uh, compost piles and we're also taking walks in our local woods and neighborhoods and finding other places to um, do micro traps. It's um, sort of a fun thing to do to set a trap and then come back and, and investigate what it is. Um, it's a cool idea if you've got some people you want to uh, take a hike with and take another hike with. Get them out there twice. Uh, so we're out here inoculating the um, mushrooms. With, uh, we're inoculating straw with uh, mushrooms, we're using blue oysters and wine caps um, that we got from Fungi Ally. Great guy, uh, you get the, the spawn along with some great advice. Um, and I'm just saying, you give advice, I don't know, you know, take consultation and stuff, but um, great guy. Um, great people, uh, anybody who's dealing with mushrooms usually uh, has a good sense of um, what it is, because they're almost strange to us. Um, a lot of people, are, it's like a mystery um, with mushrooms about, you know, what they are and what's the benefit. So uh, here's our mushroom spawn. They come in those little bags like that, and we'll kind of layer it in. We'll moisten our straw a little bit and uh, crumble in some of those, uh, uh, some of that spawn. And we'll just do that up like a lasagna and set those bins aside for them to do the thing. Here's what our bins look like um, after, what was it, like a month or so? about a month and um as you can see all the, the growth of mycelium is kind of taking over the bins so this is what we're using and trying to understand when we're saying we're using uh fungi uh and we're using oysters and uh, uh oyster mushrooms and wine cap mushrooms as uh remediators and just you know the substance that's going to help uh, take up some of this stuff and we were so excited about it. I went home and we did it. I did it with the family. So there's no joke. Uh, these are really cool things that you could do with your family, um, with your friends, and just get to know, get to know the things, get to know your community, and that being the um, the mushroom, get to know your protozoa, get to know your bacteria. Because um, what I found out was that in the human body, there's like um, as much weight of bacteria and the weight of a brain, you know, that we have in our body. So like there's there's they're everywhere, and um, we have to welcome them and understand which ones are beneficial. So um, we're seeing an increase in biodiversity um, on our site in all forms, and it's a beautiful thing to capture. Uh, we're seeing neighborhood uh, come together and walk by, and some are curious as, like, what's going on. And when they find out, they're really uh, supportive and um, kind of root, root on the youth as they're doing this work. I think that's very empowering. Um, and then not only that, um, the next time they come by, they're telling and sharing their stories as um, that's what I feel like is the connection that is needed just as much as connecting a plant with um, a certain bacteria. Um, so we're doing some more tissue testing. 
Uh, we're going to send our, our results to um, Cornell. So here's just like a basic, like what they're asking for. And, and we're testing our mugwort that we have found um, and a few other plants uh, that we're going to test consistently to uh, compare the data. Now the different uh, SOPs and techniques to um, sampling these leaves, these, uh, but um, you know we just want to be consistent. Uh, here's like a set of rules or a set of um, you know SOPs that you can follow um, in order to take a consistent uh, analysis. So you know, for example, send the sample out on a day that's going to be early in the week, so the sample arrives um, to the lab in enough time for them to process it. Because um, on the weekends, they're probably not working, it's going to sit in the lab, and the lab results will change. Um, so we try to be consistent in the way that we're going to do it. And um, these slides should be available if anybody's interested um, in looking further into this. This was all given to me, um, this knowledge. Again, you know, this is a team effort. Um, and this came from uh, Ruben from NOFA. Um, so when people know their stuff, it's good to, uh, to talk to them. And, how to figure out more. Sorry, I'm jumping on the slides. But yeah, um, print the labels and put them on the bags. Um, the leaves are as clean as possible, no dew, uh, dirt, and dust, and fertilizers. Um, and just try to be consistent in the sample you're taking. And pick a lab too, because you know labs are, are sometimes not consistent with other labs in the way that they do these results or that they provide their analysis. Andrew? Yep. There's a question in the chat. Can you give the name of the uh, of the lab that will test for heavy metals? Yep, that's um contest lab. Um, I can even go back to you. If you, got, you know, maybe we can circle back at the end of the. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, contest labs, and they're in um East Long Meadow, I believe. So it's cool to like kind of go to the lab and drop your lab or even um even your samples, you know, there's certain protocols and how you're supposed to do it, um, certain times that you're supposed to take your sample. Um I'm just gonna go back, sorry guys. But um yeah, so you want your sample to be at a certain temperature for them to do um what they have to do. Um so it's always best to wherever you are gonna bring it. Make sure you look up the website um, on their directions and, and follow their protocol. You don't want to get too far in the process and then you know they're unable to process uh, what it is that you brought uh, for whatever reason. Contest Labs, um, that's one. We can go to Cornell, we can go to UMass. Um, but for the RICA uh, Heavy 8 medals, uh, contest labs. So these are just some charts that um, we can also look at that we've been, um, sorry, I'm jumping around with these slides. These are some charts we can look at to just assess like what um, levels are, you know, in the, some of the vegetables and stuff that we're eating already. But um, this is going to take some time to go through some of these charts and to best understand um, which data that we have that will, you know, be comparable to these type of notes. But the best thing we can do is be consistent with our testing and continue to test. So that way, when we do have um, a better understanding of how to interpret the analysis, we'll have like qualitative, you know, enough of the information. So these are just examples of different. Um, metals uh, that will come from different uh, industries, like print industry, paper mill, uh, textiles. Uh, so I'll try to leave the link when I get a second after this. Um, yeah, somebody put it in the, we, put a uh, link in a chat. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, and then um, there's just other charts that I, I found um, kind of interesting where, it, you know, it'll say calcium and, you know, where we can get it from, like barley, kale, uh, grain, green, and milk. So if we can understand our food and understand what mineral is, min minerals um, are keeping us going, uh, which ones are we lacking or deficient in, we can kind of help um, ourselves through helping the soil. Um, that's what I believe. 
But what to look forward to is us growing out those microbes, um, better understanding um, how to inoculate those into our um, growing spaces. Um, we're also going to do some more plant tissue testing. So we're interested in, in, in finding the results and how to um, best determine what it is. You know, and I want to test things like 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 collard greens, for instance, because I love growing collard greens um, myself, and that's something that I know will take up a lot of whatever's in the soil. So to better understand that product, um, you know, how how much would you like to buy your collard greens off of somebody local that's really understanding the soil and the content of the product that they're making and not just, you know, throwing something in the bag and calling it a green. Um, I mean, if people are going to eat some food like that, then let, let people eat the food wherever it comes from. But, I mean, it, it's really important to, to go ahead and, and make that connection between soil health and human health. Um, biochar is something else that we're going to be studying, uh, learning some more about. We'll learn how to create biochar, um, whether it's in our Weber grills or if it's in a, a fire pit while we're, you know, we're hanging out with family, or if we do it in a more uh, controlled environment. Uh, we want to make this biochar, and this stuff is just amazing. It has, um, you know, the properties of the wood change um, into this extreme amount of surface area that bacteria and, um, you know, different microbes can inhabit and live in um, for a long time, uh, it'll stay in the soil. So it's basically like we're building like these little, introducing these little hotels into the soil. Um, we're gonna learn how to inoculate these uh, with different ferments and um, compost teas and whatnot um, and add these into our soils. So that's very exciting. Uh, you know, it's not always easy to get away with burning stuff in the city. But when there's a will, there's a way, and we will try to do it the most sustainable way possible um, in the hopes to create a healthier soil. So this is our space, and um, that's the project. This is the work. Um, we hope that you're able to take something away, and if you have something that you can leave for us, I hope you can drop it in the chat. Um, you're learning, so. Say for me, Sister Dora. I'm sorry. Um, I, I, that's it for uh, slides. If you, if we have any uh, questions or any conversations. Yeah, there's no questions right now. Um, in the wait a minute, let's see. Something just came up. <laughs> uh, oh, there's no questions. Someone's just um, giving you accolades. <laughs> um. Um. Yeah, and, we, and we're also gonna connect. Um. I didn't mention like oral histories. So we, we want to like um, go to these surrounding spaces around any of these sites and, and connect with the people who have like a history, whether it's they've been there for a few years and they, they have a certain feeling or connection to the space or something they'd like to see. And or if it's somebody who's been there for, you know, generations and um, they can tell us a story about the land. Because um, I think that's always important in, these, in this type of work. Okay. And then just our our living history too. Like these, these youth are um are doing something that they'll be able to look back on and, and learn from. Um so I think to, to address our, our learning histories and for them to document their stories and experiences um is a part of this project. It's not all just science, um there's a lot of community involved as well. Okay. Um Let's see, Andrew, if you are interested in seeds or plants, start for native pollinator plants, native. Oh, someone's. Oh, nice. Can, can, can you, yeah. Can you oh, yeah, see that? That's awesome. Um, yes. Yeah, I'll drop an um, uh, email in the chat if, or, you know, not sure how it's. Okay, great. So any uh, any last minute questions before we um, close out? Well, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, if you're interested in uh, um, upcoming education events, you can visit um, our website at nofamass.org. Um, the NOFA staff and board members would like to thank you all for being here. 
We would also like our, to thank our sponsor again, um, the Massachusetts uh, Department of Agricultural Resources, MDA. Um, we do have a, a YouTube page as well. You can um, visit our YouTube page on YouTube and we're looking forward for seeing, to seeing you at our next event. I believe it's in March. I believe it's in March. So, so thank you all for being here. Andrew, did you want to say anything before we? Oh, uh, thank you. I, I still see some people, um, a lot of people in the, um, in the screen. So that's amazing. Um, you stayed. So thank you. I appreciate it. Um, this work, uh, um, I'm learning and is very um, passionate about this. So, yeah. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.